fine is not Emacs. And then there was sign for sign is not Emacs. And then there was Aina for Aina is not Emacs. And there was mince for mince is not complete Emacs. And version 2 of Aina was called Zwei, for Zwei was Aina initially. So you can have a lot of fun with recursive acronyms. So I look for a recursive acronym for something is not Unix. But when I tried the usual four letter method, I saw that none of the combinations was a word, at least not in English. And if it doesn't have another meaning, it's not a joke. So what could I do? Well, I thought I could make a contraction. And then I'd get a three-letter recursive acronym. So I tried every possible letter. Anu, Bnu, Knu, Dnu, Inu, Fnu, Gnu. But Gnu is the funniest word in the English language. It's used for lots of wordplay. And the reason is because according to the dictionary, the G is silent and it's pronounced new. So anytime you were going to say new, you could say you could write G and U and pronounce it GNU instead. And you've got a joke. Many, many years ago, some people occasionally said, hey, what's GNU? And now there's a better answer. You can answer them, GNU is not Unix. And the best part is, it sounds like you are being evasive. It sounds like you are refusing to tell the person what it is and you're only telling him what it's not. But in fact, you're giving the exact correct answer. It only sounds like you're being evasive. So, uh, and, and there was even a funny song based on the word GNU when I was a child. So, given a specific meaningful reason to call a particular thing GNU, I couldn't resist. And this illustrates the hacker spirit. What does it mean to be a hacker? It means to enjoy playful cleverness. And this is not just with computers, it's in any area of life. You could be playfully clever. If, if you enjoy that and you like to do that, then you're a hacker. And whenever you do that, it's hacking. So this name was an example of a typical part of the hacker spirit, which we call ha-ha only serious, which is here I was starting the most important thing I would ever do in my life. I knew that if it succeeded, it would be the most important thing I'd ever do in my life. But that didn't mean we can't make jokes. So I gave it a name, which is a joke. <clears throat> However, when it's the name of our operating system, please do not follow the dictionary. If you pronounce it new, you will get people very confused. You see, we've been working on it for 22 years now, so it's not new anymore. But it still is and always will be GNU, regardless of the people who pronounce it erroneously Linux. So how did that confusion get started? How did it happen that there are tens of millions of people using the GNU system and they think they're using Linux? Well, during the 1980s, our task was to develop all these pieces we needed for a Unix-like operating system. Lots of components were needed. I say we because from the very beginning, it was my intention to recruit other people to join in. The goal was not to have an operating system written entirely by me. The goal was to have a free operating system as soon as possible. 
and everything I, I planned was to help us get there as soon as possible. So I recruited other people. As, Do you want to write some piece of the system? So various people started writing various components. And for the big components, the ones that seemed like they would be hard, I tried to find shortcuts. So I tried to see if somebody else had written a program that we could manage to use, perhaps changing it. Maybe the existing free program would be just a starting point or just part of it. But still, that helps. That helps you get it done sooner. <clears throat> so I did that with all of the major components. And sometimes I found something and sometimes I didn't. By 1990, we had all of the essential components and many others except one. One of the major essential components, the kernel, was still missing. And in 1990, I found a starting point. I found a program called Mach, which people refer to as a microkernel, meaning it does, if you look at the kernel's job, Mach does the bottom half. And the idea is on top of that, you write specific programs to provide the specific kernel services that you want. And they run in user space which means it's easier to debug them. So I thought, well, half the job has been done for us. We just have to write the other half in user space. So this way we'll get our kernel done really soon. And this architecture of a microkernel plus multiple servers is also what people thought at the time was the, was the, the advanced best way to write a kernel. It turns out that that design has some problems. And uh, it took many years to get our kernel to run at all. And it still doesn't run well enough that we could recommend it to you to use. Fortunately, we didn't have to wait for that. Because in 1991, a college student in Finland developed his own kernel. He used the old-fashioned monolithic design and he got it to barely work in less than a year. This kernel, which he called Linux, initially was not free software. In 1992, he liberated it by changing the license. He adopted the GNU General Public License, which is the license that I had written for use in the components of GNU. Now, the GNU General Public License, or GNU GPL for short, is not the only free software license. There are many other free software licenses. But it's the most popular one. It's used for about 70% of all free software projects. And it's special in that it is a copyleft license. Cop you see, all free software licenses give you the four freedoms. That's what makes it a free software license. If it, if it gives you the four freedoms, then it's a free software license. But, when, but in regard to freedom number three, there's a choice. It has to permit you to distribute modified versions. The question is, can you make those modified versions proprietary? Some licenses permit that. Copyleft is the requirement that says when you distribute a modified version, it must have the same license. In other words, the modified versions must be free as well. So copyleft is a way of utilizing copyright law, but instead of using it to subjugate people, we use it to protect everyone's freedom. <clears throat> so the idea is <clears throat> we make sure that by, when the program reaches you, you get the four freedoms. And the way we do that is we say the middleman is forbidden to remove the freedoms before the program reaches you. There are also free software licenses which are not copyleft. And they do permit proprietary modified versions. So in those, those licenses do not, they recognize every 